Welcome to Astoria Film Festival Presents, Astoria Film Festival's weekly half-hour program featuring our films, filmmakers, events, and the local community. Today, in honor of Black History Month, we're speaking with our filmmakers, Stephen St. Pierre and Keisha Pert. Stephen St. Pierre is a Queens-born filmmaker who won an audience award at our 2019 festival with his film, Corey. Keisha Pert's film, Perfect Intervention, was a finalist in our 2020 festival. Play. Go pack your stuff. Where were you, mommy? It's, it's amazing that you, you know, you asked to have me and I'm honored. So thank you so much. Oh, no, really. Uh, we are honored. I'm honored uh, that you took time. You know, I know a lot of people have been asking for like time from their black friends uh, <laughs> in these, you know, and, and a lot of the weight is falling on your shoulders to rectify things that have been done to you forever. Right. Um, and it's it's not fair, it's not right. So I, I don't want this to be that, uh, but I, I wanted it to kind of, how could we help during this time? What could we do? Um, and I just want to highlight what you're up to and the work you've done and how brilliant you are. Um, so that's why I'm here. <laughs> no, thank you, I appreciate it. And this, I don't, I don't look at this like that because you know, having known you over the past year and change and just knowing people who have been part of the Story Film Festival, this isn't really something new. This is how, this is just how you are in life and how the festival conducts itself. So it doesn't feel like it's something being put on because of a moment. You know what I'm saying? So I, I don't look at it that way at all, no. Thank you. I appreciate that. Yeah, I mean, we started because we felt that, um, you know, there were so many underrepresented voices in media and film and could we help um, bridge that gap, starting with the children? You know, the kids here don't get a fair shake on so many levels. Um, I was working in an after-school program uh, with a bunch of kids and um, who were very interested in learning film production. And that's kind of where this all started. Like, how can I com connect them with the filmmakers in the area? Um, so, you know, and I wanted filmmakers who look like them. I wanted them to see themselves represented you know, to, to feel like they had a chance. Um, and then when we had the first festival, I remember being like, oh, wow, these people kind of need support too. You know, like they, they're, they need a community, they need our support as well. You know, it's still um, underrepresented filmmakers need support, need community and need to push themselves into the forefront because they're being left out a lot of the picture. Right. right, had a little bit of connectivity issue, but I'm back. <laughs> I, I noticed. I was like, I was like, oh, he's mesmerized by what I'm saying, <laughs> or his screen froze. <laughs> a little bit of both. A little bit of both. You know, and you know, like you said, when I, I saw it there, when I came, you know, you had all the students who were like interning or like you know, PAing uh, the whole festival, or you know, just kind of being production coordinators, and you kind of just like sat back and let them do their. I was just like, wow, like all these young, like you know, tweens and teenagers just kind of conducting things, holding interviews. And I was, yeah, I was amazed. I was very amazed and moved by, you know, just, and just in my journey of like, uh, you know, wanting to be able to help young, young, younger, younger generation of young kids come up and see what I do, you know, and I'm nowhere near where I want to be or feel like, you know, these celebrities or people who've made it. But I figured if I just start now, you know, touching the youth, they can see the journey of someone before they get there so they know it's possible, you know, instead of just seeing someone that might not be reachable to them, but they see someone in the grind every day in the trenches doing it, they're like, wow, like this person, you know, this adult man who's like not a celebrity, but he's grinding and he's still like coming and talking to us or showing us how it's done or what have you, it can be much more attainable to them, you know? And, and that's what it's all about in my mind. Like, 
if they see, you know, I grew up here. My, my parents were immigrants, working class, like, you know, um, I had to fight for every position I ever got, but it's still possible. I'm, I'm not a celebrity, you know, <laughs> but uh, I still made a living. It's, I, I wanted the kids to see, you can still make a good living and you can still have this as a career, even if you don't become Spielberg. Right. You know what I mean? Like you don't have to become Spielberg. You just have to work, do good work and, right. and make a, a life out of this, you know? And that's more the lesson I want to get across because I think people have, you know, it's like hoop dreams, <laughs> you know, but that's unrealistic. And then you may quit because you don't get there, but right. you need to have that in between where you still have a good life, you make a living, doing things you love and you can learn from people who are doing that. That's kind of where I'm at with it, you know? Right. Yeah. And my parents were immigrants too. I'm first generation. So I didn't have, you know, the parents to understand America and know it because they came here at adult age themselves where they just kind of were doing just, you know, uh, uh, manual labor. Whatever they could. Yeah, whatever <laughs> they could to just get, get us by, you know? So I kind of was like that first person in my family to try to learn and understand America and things and go to, you know, go to school, go to college, navigate all of that. Um, and it was, it was tough. You know, I got two little brothers now, which I always try to give them information. I probably annoy them a lot because I'm always trying to just give them information, help them. Hey, this, do this better. They probably like, he just never satisfied me because I know there's more and you can be better and you can be greater. You know, if you I, want to talk a little about Corey and about new work you're working on and what kind of motivated you to get started in filmmaking, I'd love sure. to hear yeah, so, you know, like you mentioned, Corey, the short film that kind of like took me around the world in 2019, um, and then, you know, and then back home. Uh, Corey's about a young dad whose wife battles drug addiction as, his, as he fights to protect his daughter and stop the cycle. So, you know, speaking a little bit about, you know, my, my upbringing growing up in um, Queens, you know, coming here in the, um, uh, in the 80s, you know, early 80s into the 90s, seeing how when crack hit the streets pretty heavily then, you know, it kind of was really, really at its prime in those in those years. Seeing how a lot of people like, you know, I mentioned playing basketball. So it could be like my, my, my boy that I play ball with, um, you know, his, his parents at the practices or at the games rooting him on. And then six months later, his mom is like at the corner store begging me for money so she can go buy and use, you know? And so, you know, fast forward to now, um, acting, was what got me into the industry, right? It was straight up just acting first. And then, you know, I had friends and other um, people who were in the industry were like, you know, early on 2015, you know, early on for me, I just I had just started, were like, you can't just be an actor. Like, that's like the way the industry is changing. You just can't just be an actor. Like you have to be able to do more than one thing. So, you know, auditioning for a year or two and then I decided, you know what, I'm gonna start writing, you know? I had been writing sketch shows, um, you know, because I, I was a performer at the pit and I took classes at UCB for improv and, you know, oh, cool. yeah, so I had been writing sketches and things up until that point, like doing a lot of sketch shows. So, you know, I had, I had a sense for like writing and things like that, but then, you know, writing film is different and drama is different, but I took my hand at it because I just understood story. You know, I, I felt as long as I understand story, I can write. So when I started to try to like, throw around some ideas I thought back to my childhood and about those families you know that were um you know were stricken in the home due to the drug addiction and then I had a close friend um maybe about three or four years earlier from when I wrote the script that had an uncle who uh, I saw firsthand how it affected her and her grandmother which is his mother he would be in and out of the home you know he would come and take things leave disappear for months at a time and I just saw how the family was so affected. They just had gradual stages, you know, throughout that whole year of process. So those images came rushing into my mind as I started to like think about ideas. And I said, I'm going to write that story, you know, cause we see a lot of the drug, um, the, you know, the, the drug abuser and their journey and what they go through, but we don't really see a lot of how it affects the family because, you know, essentially they're a victim of their loved one's circumstance, you know, with them leaving the home, they could have been, a major breadwinner or contributed to the family. Now that's gone, you know, that support system, you know, cause I really believe, you know, the mother and the father play integral roles in their children's lives. You know, a lot of single parent homes, they do their best, but you know, to, to you need, you need something from each, you know, there's something that you just can't learn from a mother that a father can, or from a father that a mother can do. So I just said, you know what, I'm going to write from a bit of the family's perspective, how it affects them 
and what happens when that person comes back home and how the family reacts to to the drug abuser you know and it, so it was, was such a it's so great to see that representation like i i remember watching it for the first time and just thinking wow like this is um it's real like it, it you know it's not like some imagined hollywood version of it um it was just so real and down to earth and and loving portrayal of what was going on you know and and how much of a, a tug of war there is you know because you don't want to not let that person back in the house you right. don't want to not have that person see their child right. you right. know yeah it's a love you know the love is deep um in any situation because you know, I, I just showed a 10, 11 minute slice of life, but there's a whole story between these two people, you know? And that's what I imagined when I saw my friend's parents or whoever it was in the community. These people been married, whatever, however long, or been high school sweethearts or known each other for a little while. So it's not that easy, you know? This is just another problem that a family has to go through. It's just a, a very extreme problem, but it's something that they have to deal with, you know? Yep. You yep. don't just write off someone you love, you know, just, just like that. Even if you, even if you say things, sometimes you may say it, but you don't actually do it. You know, you get in arguments, you say things sometimes you don't mean, or this, that, and the other, but what you do, you know, how you show your love is still very evident, you know, in, in the person's, you know, the eyes don't lie. So, you know, that's, that's a great crazy. point. Yeah. I, I never thought of it that way. Like you can say, you know, you're no longer my son or you're, you know, but you're, you know, it's always your son. <laughs> yeah, yeah, it's always son. You're always thinking about him. You're always hoping for the best of him. You're probably asking people who you know who knows him, or like your un your your brother and sisters who are his aunts and uncles. Like, how is he doing? You know, this, that, and the other. Like keeping tabs on it from afar sometimes because you know maybe your relationship isn't just the best, but you know you try. You know, you, you try to just keep tabs and make sure that they're doing okay because you brought this person into the world. You wanna you wanna know they're great, and then you know in, a, in a, a situation of a marriage or a, a relationship, you know, this is the person you chose to love that you just sometimes, sometimes you didn't choose to love them. Like that's just what happened. You know, it's the person that you love. So it's Absolutely. like, you know, this is my person and I want to make sure that they're protected in this world and cared for and, you know, support them to the utmost. But sometimes circumstances don't allow it, but that feeling is still there, you know, and you can't let it go. And what are you working on these days or what, or what were you working on before COVID stopped all the work? <laughs> right, right. Because um, I was fortunate enough to um, win a grand prize at the Queen City Film Festival in New Jersey. Oh, wow. Yeah. Congrats. Which is amazing. Yeah. Thank you. Thank you. Yeah. So that's a great film festival that's being held in Jersey. And the grand prize was a production contract. So they were going to produce my next short film. Yeah. Oh, that's awesome. <laughs> right. So yeah. we were in conversations leading up, you know, at the end of the year, like around holiday time. So we started talking about holidays came around and a new year. So we're like, all right, we're going to pick up on the beginning of 2020 and start going into pre-production and things like that. And, you know, one thing led to another and quarantine came and just kind of like put that all to a stop, you know. But um, but yeah, but I'm still in conversations with um, Lamar Maxson. He's the festival founder and, and has the production company. So we're looking to gear up and, you know, 2021, have it come out. So the story that um, most likely, because we still haven't settled on what they're going to produce, I have to, you know, kind of like maybe give them a few ideas. Like, hey, I got this script. I got this one. What can we do? You know, budget, budgetary wise. Are, are these scripts you already had or are they scripts you're currently been working on? I have one that I have, I have written kind of right after I wrote Corey, which I was, I've been just kind of like, fine tuning and workshopping. I've done like a couple of zoom table reads just to kind of like hear people's opinions on it. Um, that one's about two street detectives and, and the dynamic between their friendship and betrayal. Um, so that one is the one that I would like to have produced next, but depending mm -hmm. on budgetary, um, you know, restrictions, if we're able to do that one or not, but it is something that I still want to get produced, you know, uh, when it's all said and done. And if not that one, you know, we, we have other ideas that, um, you know, we'll, we'll talk about and I can write it or their production team can write it and I'll direct it and act or I'll act and produce and they'll direct whatever, you know, whatever we figure out, you know, just, <laughs> just to get something created and done. Absolutely. Yeah. I mean, your name's on it. It's your work. Uh, it's, it's good. <laughs> it's all good. <laughs> Thanks. Thanks. Yeah. And I'm still staying, you know, I'm still staying active as far as like creating uh, short content for internet, for Instagram or Facebook or, you know, doing like little sketches and skits and things like that. 
just to keep yeah, I've, ca I've caught some of them. It's wonderful. <laughs> it's you. helped me through this COVID thing. <laughs> right, thanks. Yeah. I have one that I had, I had done um, called Room for Rent. It's literally a one minute character based comedy series where I play myself and I have these roommates that just are like off the wall that every episode ends with me having to get a new roommate. Um, so I have some uh, exciting news that I'll be announcing very soon, but we got picked up for distribution uh, regionally. Yeah. So wonderful. I'll be, I'll be announcing that once it's official, but I'm pretty confident. So that's wonderful. Do you, yeah. do you want me to not put that in until you announce it? Like if no, I... I'll, I'll announce where afterwards. But I'm yeah. saying, do you want me not to have this as part of it? Cause I, I can always edit this out if you don't want me to say it before you say it. No, it's fine. You're good? Yeah, yeah. As long as I don't say the name of where yet. No. Okay. Yeah. So um, the <laughs> was that based on personal experience, the roommate thing? It, it, no, because honestly, Nina, I never had a roommate. I haven't had a roommate what? since college, maybe. Like since out of college, I've just lived alone, you know? So. Oh, I'm jealous. <laughs> I Because I, I could literally write that from personal experience. That I'm story. sure. That's, that's what it, it is from like, what I imagine can happen having a roommate, you know, and maybe, maybe, you know, I'm sure there's subconscious stories or situations I hear about, but yeah, it was literally just me here one time, just sitting here thinking about just, just thinking. And I was just like, improving with myself, you know, just going back and forth. Like, what if I was my own roommate and I said this and I want to borrow his underwear or this, you know, like just little stupid things. And that's where it just got birthed <laughs> from right there. Um, I mean, with the with the recent events happening, you know, it's and kind of even going back to Corey, right? How we talked about like the story is grounded, and and a lot of that, and that's kind of what I want people to just know, because I did a Facebook Live the other day, maybe like ten days ago or so, and I did it on Facebook, even though Instagram is where most people do their lives on Instagram, but I chose Facebook because that's where most of my white and non-black, uh, you know, friend, social groups are on Facebook. So I said, because I started to notice how just um, people would see the injustices that happens to the black people, you know, whether it be George Floyd, Breonna Taylor, uh, and the numerous names, and they may be, they may be appalled at the fact that it happens, but then after that ten minutes of seeing it on news, it's over for them, right? Mm -hmm. But then they'll look at somebody like me, and they don't see me as that person. You know, because yep. I had got a text right before I, I made the decision to go live. I had got a text from somebody and they said, you know, just showing love, just reaching out, saying, you know, just I just want to say I love you. And I wish the world could see, you know, you uh, as I see you as just a, you know, talented, kind, caring man. And I said, wow, that's how people see me. But they don't even say black man because it's like to them, I'm not a black man because I'm not like whatever they saw on TV or whoever those were. So I said, you know what? I'm going to go on Facebook Live and talk about my experiences. Because a lot of people who know me from the industry or know me for the past maybe like 10 years or so don't know what I went through growing up, you know? Because I've had my run-ins run with police. You know, I've had a gun drawn on me by five cops surrounding me in my car like I was some type of uh, high-end serial bank robber or something like they were trying to catch, you know? And it was for no reason. It was just because they said I fit the description of a chicken, a fried chicken uh, place being robbed uh, before. And, and just saying, oh, we, I mean, you know, so, so I went on live to say that just so people can see that this can happen to, and like it literally can happen to anybody. It's yeah, not yeah. what they perceive as a black person who, who gets targeted like this. It's any black person for the, for the most part. You know, even even some of the high end celebrities or wealthy people, if they get caught in the wrong day or somebody doesn't know who they are, they're just a black person, you know. So that's kind of what just like storytelling and, um, you know, me, me using my voice and platform is just to remind people, you know, hey, listen, I'm black. It can happen to me. And this is what we're fighting for. We're just trying to tell our stories and say that we're just as much part of the human race and deserve equal rights and uh, fair treatment as any other person. You should be able to live your life without being persecuted just because you just have because. a certain skin color. Right, right. You know, just for being born. <laughs> you know, I, I didn't come out the womb saying, you know what, Doc, make me black. You know, like you just, like you just, that's just who you are. So it's like, why should, you know, and, and it's anything. I know 
you know, and, and just like, you know, uh, the LGBTQ community, you know, if you're gay, you're gay. You shouldn't have to be treated a certain way just because, you know, just because your color, just because your sexual orientation, your religion, your race, your power, whatever, you know, it's like disability, disability, right? It's just like, listen, this is supposed to be America, the land of free. Let's get, let's really go towards that, you know, instead of having to be lip service and propaganda. Let's just really, really make it that way. And we all, it takes all of us, it takes every person, you know, regardless of race to make that happen. Amen. <laughs> <laughs> and actually, I, I saw something somewhere that really made me think and, and stuck with me. And I was like, yes, that it's white supremacy is a white issue, right? We, we're we benefiting. So if anybody is going to take it apart, it has to be us. So it can't, yeah. Yeah. It can't be like, oh, that's a black thing. No, no, mm. you're, cre you're the oppressor. You're creating this situation. Yeah. You have to dismantle it. You know, you have right. to have the talks and fight the drunk uncles and, and all that craziness it's almost like um one of my i'm gonna say favorite movie a movie that I like knocked up uh there's a judd apatow movie with Seth yeah Rayden. yeah i know it yeah craig robinson but there's a scene like you know i take it like a club you have the bouncer at the club and he wouldn't let you know leslie mann and um Catherine heigl in the club you know but it's not up to the people who can't get in the club to try to it has to be the club owners and the bouncers be like all right you know what we're letting the rope down and we're letting everybody in you know so yeah, Very good point. Very Today good. we are speaking with Keisha Pert, uh, who created Perfect Intervention. We're really worried about you. Worried about what? This. We're worried about this. What's wrong with this? Sarah, you just got home from work and you're wearing a cat onesie. So? <laughs> Take it off. Why? Because you look ridiculous and it's not appropriate for work or life or anything. Just Take it off! Fine! So, my first question for you is, can you tell us how you came up with the idea for Perfect Invention and like what it was like to create that work? Yeah, so I love cats. I'm a cat lover, um, but I feel like crazy cat ladies get such a bad rap everyone hears people who love cats and it's a woman and they're like oh you're just a crazy cat lady and while there are some crazy cat ladies most of us really just love cats we have a love for cats they're great animals they're independent and so i thought it would be really funny to write a film about a crazy cat lady but show that we're not all crazy we're all lovable and we just love cats. So I was watching the show Intervention on TV and that's where the whole idea sparked of wouldn't it be funny to throw an intervention for a crazy cat lady? And then out sparked Perfect Intervention. Oh yeah, I love the title too, the play on words with the three R's. It's yeah. Perfect. So funny. So can you tell us how like your life experiences affected like your creative journey and like how did they influence this work specifically? Yeah, so um, I didn't really consider myself much of a writer, let alone creator, up until very recently. I had written something a couple of years ago, but I didn't really think anyone would find it entertaining or funny, so I didn't really feel that motivated to create anything. And then after producing my first film and having such a great experience with it, I decided that I wanted to create more things. So I found some motivation, and I just, just decided to trust myself, and if... I think it's funny, and if I think it's a good project, that's really what matters most. And obviously, hopefully, I would come up with a good, you know, end result. But I feel like if you love your project and you believe in your project, that's really what matters. And your people are going to come to you. Your audience will find you. And as long as you stick to that, you know, that's kind of what's the driving force behind it. And there's a lot of cat lovers out there, and there's a lot of crazy cat people out there that I thought they would just find this so ridiculous and funny. So... The creative process, yeah, just kind of stemmed from there and just trusting my gut and being like, I know it's a ridiculous idea, but if I think it's funny, I'm going to freaking make it. So that's what I did. I decided to make a film about cats. <laughs> I totally love that. Completely agree with you. And it was such a breath of fresh air to watch like a comedy because I, I, I didn't know what to expect when I first watched it. <laughs> and the second it started, I was like, oh my God, I think this is going exactly where I think it's going. And so ridiculous. I, so, it was so funny. I absolutely loved it. So, um, in regards to like the film itself, what, mm -hmm. this is your first time writing? 
script? No, this is actually my second film. So this, um, my very first film is called Audition Antics. I had written that, honestly, only a couple months prior to shooting uh, Perfect Intervention. So I shot both of my films roughly about two to three months apart. So this was my second film. So I had a little bit of experience under my belt. I knew what I was doing a little bit, still not really, but I, I felt like I could tackle this having gone through the filmmaking with my first project. Right. Cool. No, that's great. So like with this film, obviously when you finish it, I feel like every piece of art can be fun, but it also comes with like a tad bit of a message as well. Mm -hmm. So when you finish making this film and your audience has finished watching it, any viewer, what's just one message you wanted to convey to them after they finished watching it? Or how did you want them to feel? So my main message that I wanted to get across with this film is we're not all crazy cat ladies. We just have really big hearts and I want people to see that it doesn't matter whether you love cats or dogs, animals are great. They add so much joy to your life. And I want people to see that you can love an animal no matter what kind of animal it is. And it doesn't mean you're crazy. I want people to know that it's just a fun feeling. And you know, cats are great. I just really love cats. So I just wanted to make a film about cats, but more so, yeah, I just wanted people to understand we're not all crazy cat ladies. We just love cats and we have a big heart. And that was the main message I think I was trying to get across with this film. Right. No, yeah, I totally get that. It was done extremely well. And I'm going to keep my fingers crossed that we get to meet at the Story Film Festival in October. I know. I really hope so. And it's like in my neighborhood, I was like, this is perfect. I love the story. I've been here for almost eight years. And I think it would be so great to just have a film in the city that I, in the borough that I live in. I, that's why I'm really excited. So I hope, I hope COVID will allow that to happen for us. It's so ironic because I have a film in the festival as well, but I made a documentary about my grandmother and she recently got a dog. Oh. <laughs> but she's like 78. And I was like, okay. But, you know, I decided it's something to shine a little light on, but still, I yeah. think it's cool that we both, uh, tapped into our inner creativity forces in regards to animal life so yeah animals are really great it honestly just adds you know I live with roommates but we all have pretty separate schedules uh, so it's just really nice to come home and she's there greeting me at the door she meows at me and you know it just warms your heart and I love every time I see her I'm like I love you so much <laughs> so it's it, they really are great they're special